everybody. Welcome back to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I am your host, Ben Pakulski. People have known me for quite a while now as being the muscle building guy. As many of you guys know, if you followed me recently, muscle building was my life for, oh, 20 plus years. <laughs> About 20 years, I would say I was, I was obsessively focused around building muscle. I wish somebody had told me in the beginning how to simplify my diet, how to simplify my training, and created just an overall framework on how to do it. And if you guys don't know my story, uh, I started off as a, you know, probably call it 17-year-old kid, 155 pounds, trying to be big, trying to get as big as I possibly could. I, I fell in love with bodybuilding at the 1998 Mr. Olympia. And I started looking for that one person who I knew could kind of give me the the straight no BS path. And I'm a no BS guy, if you haven't met me or don't know me. I don't like sugarcoating. I tend to be very, very direct. And I couldn't find them. I, I was very drawn to certain people in the sport. Milo Sarchev was very drawn to him for his direct nature, for his direct uh, communication style. Uh, Charles Poliquin and also for his direct communication style. But if you know Milos, Milos is a brilliant man and also very much a type of guy who is like, uh, you know, everything looks like a nail. He's a hammer and everything looks like a nail. It's always one way. And I found a lot of value in that. I found a ton of value in that. I found a lot of a ton of value in his confidence and his ability to build his own physique and a, a lot of value in the things that he taught. Uh, Charles Poliquin, as you know, certainly the greatest strength and conditioning coach ever. Uh, rest in peace. Brilliant man brilliant man and taught me so much. Um, but what I realized is there wasn't anyone who could give me what I would call a holistic approach, right? And holistic is kind of a term now, like it's overused and tainted a little bit, but I wanted someone who could really guide me on the training for my body because my body's different than everyone else. And I wanted somebody who could guide me on the nutrition. Like if I want to get as big as possible, how should I eat every day? Like what does it look like on a day-to-day -day basis if I want to bulk? Or if I want to cut, or if I want to just maintain lean body mass all the time as I as I build muscle, I don't I don't want to get big, you know, I don't want to get fat. And you know, everyone seemed to just throw cookie cutters at me, certainly. So, but you know, eight, as early as eighteen years old, I started be one very blessed to learn from very very bright people, and also having this insatiable desire to understand what it actually took to build muscle. Today's podcast is going to be about nutrition and all of the you know, narrowed down bullet points of what it actually takes to build muscle. And I do my best to keep this concise and really boil it down to first principles because there's a lot of noise, isn't there, on the internet. There's a lot of misinformation and oftentimes it's the message gets kind of drowned out amongst context, right? So context in, in this terms is who are we talking about and what is the objective of this person? What are their genetics? What is their history? And and what does their training look like? And these are all considerations that, you know, most average people certainly don't take into consideration. They just hear sound bites and they go, Well, this worked for me. Well, I'm awesome. That's not the same as me, nor is it the same as your best friend or even your children. They're gonna be different, right? So I started looking at nutrition through the lens of well, what do I need to do for myself? I need to start start having a basic understanding of the factors that are ultimately influencing how I eat. And so obviously a big one is my goals, right? So if my goals are to build muscle, then that's very specific. Now, sometimes goals can be uh, contradictory, can't they? So if I wanna put on as much muscle as possible and I wanna get leaner at the same time, maybe those are a bit contradictory. If I wanna build as much muscle as they possibly can and I wanna optimize for longevity, those can also be a little bit contradictory really getting clear on what your immediate goal is, is important. Because one of the things that people sometimes forget, certainly in, in my ecosystem, is that a goal isn't forever. I could achieve a goal now of putting on 25 pounds of muscle this year, and the next year decide, hey, you know what? I got that muscle now. I just want to maintain that muscle, and now I want to eat for longevity. As most of you guys know, if you've ever been a you know, 17 to 25 year old male or female, maybe, I don't know, male, you probably want to eat as much as you possibly can during the week in bulk. And then Friday comes around, maybe Thursday night, and you're like, man, I want to get lean for the weekend. <laughs> Happens a lot. Or I want to get lean for the summer. 
And so people are transient in their goals. They're fickle oftentimes and they're, they're changing directions. That's a big problem because, you know, then it causes uh, confusion around the goal and a confusion around the plan. So my goal for this podcast today is to give you guys a little insight into how to optimally eat for your goal and all the other factors you should be taking into consideration when it comes to uh, designing an effective diet nutrition plan. So when it comes to building muscle, everything is protein, right? Protein is, is everything. And you guys heard me talk about this and, and, and that's complex. Like I'm not, I don't just assume I'm starting with a really high level and then I'll chunk down and give you guys some deep insight into what I actually mean when I say protein is everything. And so if you, if you take it through the lens of what am I trying to get my body to do, right? I'm trying to get my body to accumulate or aggregate more protein, right? Accumulate more literal tissue which can only happen through amino acids, protein, right? So protein, we eat it, it breaks down into amino acids, and then it builds back up into peptides and proteins in our body. If I'm trying to maximize the, I always comes back to amplitude and duration of that stimulants, right? The peak, like I want to make sure I kind of max it out and then let's keep it on as long as possible because I want to build as much muscle as possible. Well, then I have to be considerate of all the things that allow me to do so. You know, obviously looking to aggregate, accumulate, build, as much muscle as possible. There's a lot of stuff that can play into that, such as, well, how much protein are you eating? Right? Are you eating enough protein on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis? Right? So you have to make sure you're hitting your daily protein requirements, which is simply one gram per pound on average. I've gone to size two grams per pound and saw no negative effects. In fact, I saw a lot of positive effects, but uh, don't assume that that's best for you because I'll talk about that a little bit more later. The idea of, of the amount of protein needs to be based on demand because just arbitrarily eating more protein doesn't result in more growth. It, do, it can for some people if you're undernourished, but in general, eating more protein doesn't necessarily mean more muscle. So we'll talk about that in a minute. So we want to make sure I'm taking first, just like, hey, how, how often can I get this muscle building or this muscle protein synthesis signal throughout a day? You know, there's a lot of scientists now that are arguing, like, do I need three meals or six meals? And the answer is it probably doesn't make that much of a difference for most people. For average people, it doesn't make that much of a difference if you're having three administrations of protein or four or five or six. But oftentimes, as your calories go up, there's certainly going to be a requirement to divide it into, into multiple feedings. So, you know, I don't suggest for most people consuming more than 60 to 70 grams of protein in a meal. You could, but I don't think you're going to receive the full benefit. So then if you need to consume 300 grams of protein a day, you're probably looking at at least five feedings per day to divide that amongst the day. And then, so if we're looking at, first, let's check boxes, right? First, I need to make sure I'm hitting my protein target for the day and the week and the month. And then I need to go, okay, well, is my body digesting, absorbing, and assimilating this protein? Because just because I eat protein doesn't necessarily mean I, I, it gets to where I want it to go. So do I have optimal uh, autonomic nervous state, right? The state of my, my nervous system matters when it comes to digestion, absorption, assimilation. Do I have optimal hydrochloric acid in my stomach? Do I have optimal uh, enzymes? Do I have to optimal microbiome? Do I have optimal gut health? Do I have optimal inflammation? Do I have optimal hormone status? Do I have optimal um, cellular health? There's a lot of boxes that need to be checked there. And the answer is everyone's different. So when I say optimal, this is not on or off. It's not black or white. It's a sliding scale, right? So it's, it's, either, uh, it's either way really, really good, like we have people who can eat Pop-Tarts, pizza pockets, and grow. And those people are probably very genetically blessed when it comes to all those things that I just said there, you know, digestion, and acid, and, and enzymes, and things like this. They're probably very blessed genetically or had a very, very healthy upbringing. Um, and there's people on the other end who, as I, you know, Charles Pollock would joke, could, I can have three licks of a dry prune and get fat. And those people are typically maybe a little bit broken metabolically, right? So if we think of uh, all of the things that can happen from the time that I eat a piece of steak to the time that it becomes my bicep, there's a lot of potential breaks in the chain, right? So we have to, as someone looking to optimize our nutrition, think about that. Well, how are we doing, right? One, am I eating enough, right? Great. That's step one. But that doesn't mean you're going to get the results you're after. Are you digesting, absorbing, and then assimilating all of those things? But if you're not, you probably just have expensive trips to the bathroom. So, okay, great. Now, now let's assume that we fixed the, all those, right? We've got the 
right amount of protein. It's really high quality protein. It's essential. We got all the essential aminos. It's complete protein. It's you know free from toxins. We're eating mostly wild meats, mostly animal products, probably 90% animal products not or more. As far as the, per, the protein comes from, we know definitively animal protein is going to be significantly better than any vegetable sources. Okay, great. We hit all those boxes. What does that mean I'm going to grow? No, right? Now what else needs to happen? Well, as I briefly said, the state of my autonomic nervous system plays in as well. How well is my body actually stimulating this anabolic cascade, we'll call it, right? The muscle protein synthesis cascade is dependent on a lot of factors in between. So am I one, eliciting a signal when I train? So many people, this is where I, how I created a business or why I created a business. So many people go to the gym and don't actually leave having created a signal for muscle growth. They may have created a signal for fatigue, right? Do 100 burpees, you're going to be tired, but you probably haven't listed a signal for muscle growth, right? So how do you actually create a signal for muscle growth? Now, the way I view this, and you've heard me say this a thousand times, but it's worth repeating, there could be a neurological signal, which is asking the nervous system to become more effective at recruiting more and more units per contraction. There can be a hypertrophy signal, which is tension, damage, and stress. And then there could be a metabolic signal, which is ultimately energy depletion or rate of energy production. So those three signals, or some varying amount of those three signals, has to happen in your workout to, to elicit a signal in the body to respond, right? You need to create the stress or the signal, the external stress. External stress creates an internal response that necessitates an adaptation. If I'm not doing my exercise correctly, that's okay, but you're maybe you're not going to build muscle. And I think this has literally made my business for the last 12 years off this because 98% of the people that I meet are simply not creating the right signal in the gym. You're not choosing the right exercises for you. You're not doing them correctly. You're not doing them in the correct volume, in the correct frequency, based on what your body is capable of adapting to, right? Uh, so again, there's a lot of nuance there. Uh, and uh, I've done podcasts on this in the past. I'll do more in the future. I'm literally building a program right now, or built a program that's launching April 1st on exactly what I just said. Um, how to choose exercises for your body, how to do them correctly, how to ensure you're doing the right volume and the right frequency, and then how to progress it so that you're ultimately going from you know, wherever you are now to where you want to be. And I call it phase one, because regardless of how long you've been training, the very first phase that everyone should be doing probably once a year is the equivalent of what I used to call primer program, right? But pr this phase one is a little more, well, significantly more extensive than a primer program. A primer program would be a six-week program that basically teaches you new motor patterns. Whereas this is a primer program, but it's also all the other logic and, and the thought process of like, hey, here's how to actually walk from, you know, choosing the right exercises for your body based on your mechanics through these other steps that I say. Anyways, if you guys are interested in looking for that, look for that April 1st on muscleintelligence.com. Put a lot of work into that, a lot of videos, a lot of uh, audio, a lot of podcasts, but not the point of today's podcast. If we're not creating the signal, then no matter how much protein you eat, you're not building muscle. So let's make sure that we've checked two boxes now. We've got the box of like, yes, I'm eating the protein. Second box is, hey, am I actually creating the signal for muscle building, which is ultimately end-to-end -end tension on the muscle. Right? We have to, we have to create to end tension on the muscle. We have to do that for long periods of time. Think of magnitude and duration again, right? How much tension am I creating and for how long? Uh, and ultimately, am I creating some type of negative stress, some type of eccentric loading, which is mechanical damage, and then some type of me metabolic stress, which is you know, accumulation of some type of metabolites or accumulation of some type of myokines, which are these, these secretory molecules which get released from the muscles. And those things need to happen as a result of the exercise stimulus. Otherwise, I'm just stressing my body, which is not necessarily bad because you're, you're, you are depleting energy, but you're not going to change the way you look and certainly probably not going to change the way you perform. So, so we've checked those two boxes. Let's assume, great, we've checked both of those boxes. Well, what else is there? Well, we talked, I kind of briefly said this autonomic nervous system thing. And, that, and to, in my mind, I, I take an autonomic view of training. I take an autonomic view of the body. It's just like, where's the, the state of my autonomic nervous system? If I'm constantly in a state of high stress, high sympathetic arousal, you're not going to build muscle. Your body's going to be in this constant catabolic flux. You know, catabolic is, is associated with high cortisol, high adrenaline, constantly moving, constantly fast brain. Body needs to be anabolic, which is the other side of it, which is the parasympathetic rest and digest. So then you have to be able to intervene 
and be in conscious control first and then unconscious of what's happening at the level of the autonomic nervous system. So if you're someone who's looking to optimize body composition, whether that's build fat or lose muscle, doesn't matter. You first need to intervene and interject with your autonomic nervous system and say, what's the state of my nervous system at default? When I'm sitting on my butt on the couch or when I'm sitting in my car, what's the state of my nervous system? Does my nervous system think I'm running away from a herd of hyenas or am I able to like sit here and chill? And, and that really plays in because my body's either going to be breaking down tissue which is all of the tissues, right? Yes, fat, yes, carbs, yes, protein, which is not ideal. Um, mostly carbs and, pr and protein, less fat in those cases often. Or is it replenishing itself, rebuilding itself so that the next time I go to the gym, I'm stronger and faster and more capable. And if you're spending all day running away from the tribe of hyenas, pack of hyenas in this case, I guess, you're not going to grow. So there's three boxes I have to check. Now, and you guys have heard me talk about this in the past, but what's one of the you know, if we talk about how do I elicit a parasympathetic stimulus, well, breathing is top of the list. Sleep is enormous. Food is another one, like having the right amount of food, right nutrition. You know, obviously it's things like meditation and time in nature and connection with loved ones and uh, so many things we could potentially be doing to improve our vagal tone, right? The tone of the vagus nerve. So these are three boxes we want to check. Then when it comes to optimizing for, for protein synthesis, because my body's constantly breaking down, it's not building up. Then, so if we go back to the beginning, I said, we got to hit the base number of, of protein for the day. That's kind of like a base of the pyramid, right? Well, this other one that maybe could be included in that other point, but I wanted to wait a little bit on this one, is this idea of optimizing for the amino acid leucine. And so leucine requires, or your body requires three grams on average of leucine to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Dr. Lane Norton and uh, Dr. T uh, Tom, no, Don Lehman are kind of the pioneers here. And they're, they're the ones who discovered that three grams of leucine is the signal for muscle protein synthesis in the body. It's kind of like, think of it like a light switch, right? It's flipping on this muscle protein s synthesis signal. And that's really important. So am I getting at least three grams of leucine? And at the same time, do I have enough what's called substrate amino acids, just kind of floating around my bloodstream, right? So if I don't have enough, just call it base level amino acids, which is the you know, obviously breakdown of protein, if I don't have enough, just putting leucine in there won't stimulate the protein synthesis. So I can have both this, you know, amino acid kind of pool and leucine. Now there seems to be other factors that are, that are at play there as well when it comes to this pathway called mTOR, right? So protein synthesis is a signal called mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin, and it just stimulates this body, your body to like start aggregating or accumulating more protein, which is really interesting. So there's other things at play, and I, I'm not an expert in mTOR, to be honest. I don't know that there's a lot of people who are experts on mTOR. There's an mTOR1, there's an mTOR2. I don't know how they interplay, right, to be honest. And I do know that one of them is very much dependent on carbohydrate. I mean, you have to have, think of it, I think of it, I think of it, I don't know if it's accurate, but I think of it in terms of like a fuel gauge in the cell. If your cell is depleted of nutrients, then it's much harder to stimulate uh, mTOR, MPS. Or if your cell is replenished and replete with nutrients, then it, it seems to be easier. And this is again how I kind of interpret the the science and, and it could be inaccurate. So I apologize if it is, but I'm looking deeper. Um, but right now that's the best I could find. But think of it like, and I've used to, I used to use this as a gauge when I was competing. As soon as my muscles felt like they were becoming depleted, I knew that I had elicited a signal in those muscles to, to turn over nutrients faster, right? Produce more energy per unit time. And I also knew that if my muscles felt like they were fatigued, that the chances of me growing were dropping. So I would use that certainly when I was competing as kind of a gauge for how much work I should be doing, volume I should be doing. Because if I'm doing back and all of a sudden I see this 20 or 30% kind of precipitous drop in my ability to do work, I can assume that the muscle now is fatigued or becoming more depleted of glycogen because I'm pretty consistent with my performance. It's pretty level, 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 boom, drop, right? And it may not be that drastic, but you know, like, you know, when you're like, okay, I'm, I'm cooked. Either I can't contract in a certain aspect of the range or I literally can't even do another rep. You know, you know, like, well, how much of a drop off have I seen during my training? Is it 20%? Is it 30%? Is it 50%? That's way too much, right? So, like, relative to where you were at the peak of the of the workout. <clears throat> so, uh, that's important.
important to just feel as though, where am I relative to my full glycogen state? So when I'm preparing athletes for contests, as an example, uh, I usually just tr will train them. If I'm training them in person in the gym, we'll train them until we see some type of decline in that body part's ability to perform. And then either we go and do a different body part, which is usually the case when you're doing a contest, or if we're not doing a contest, then we'll just maybe end the, in the workout and send them home. Because obviously when we're doing a contest, we want to deplete multiple muscles of glycogen because that's often necessary for fat loss or calorie depletion, calorie expenditure. But off season, we may not be so uh, inclined to deplete more muscle groups, right? Because we want to kind of aggregate more calories and more protein. We want to create the signal. We want to go home so we can do it again often. Okay. So now we talked a little bit about uh, mTOR, muscle protein synthesis. Now we, now we want to talk about, uh, in the beginning I said, muscle building is all about protein, and it is. And it's also about creating the frequent signal or the frequent demand to synthesize protein, right? So what creates a demand? Well, tension creates a demand. Damage creates a demand. Maybe even metabolic stress creates some type of demand, right? So if we're doing that more often, in many cases, it's actually advantageous. So especially for someone who's a hard gainer. So my theory on people who are hard gainers is low volume, high frequency, right? So if you can train twice a day as a hard gainer for 30 minutes, you're going to have, in my experience, a lot more progress because I want you to go super heavy, create as much tension as you possibly can. And really, and again, the goal is get as good as you possibly can at the high leverage exercise, the high compound type exercises. And then do it as often as you can, and I'll say it differently, as often as you can recover from, right? Because doing workouts that you can't recover from is a waste of your time, right? You're not able to adapt. You won't adapt. Then you're just listening fatigue and stress. So we're going down this list of things that are influencing how much muscle we can add. Certainly how often I'm able to train this body part plays in. And, and you could talk about total volume throughout the week or, and maybe not or, but and uh, how often is it happening? So as an example, it's been suggested something called the repeated bout effect. If I do 20 sets for back, it's probably going to be more advantageous for me to spread that out over two workouts, right? If I'm going to do 25 sets or maybe 20, I don't know, 26, 28 sets, it may be advantageous for me to spread that over three workouts instead of one or two. Again, that, that's this is really subjective. This is where things start to go a little bit wrong. Ben said this, hold on a minute. If Dorian Yates says do four sets, if Ben says do 30, like, hold on a minute. Uh, it's very individualized, right? You are not Dorian Yates, either am I. And I'm also not Mike Mincer. And these guys are genetically blessed, absolute psychological animals, and a really deep connection to their muscle. They could push really hard, harder than 99.9% than .9 of humans ever will. And so they could put a lot more work into one set than you and I ever could, right? Maybe during my career, I could, I could keep up. You know, I certainly would never give up and... and admit that I couldn't, but 99% of people are from nowhere close, right? I was a ferocious animal when I was competing. I, you guys, most people will never come close. They just don't get it. And so could I have done one set to failure? Yes. How long would it have worked? I don't know. Maybe forever. Or maybe then it becomes the type of thing where one set works for a few weeks or a few months per exercise. And I got to go to two, right? Who knows? Um, but again, it's individual. It's based on a lot of things. And a lot of things like the next thing I'm going to tell you. So how often, Ben, should I then train? And how, how much volume should I do? Answer, what are your, what's your recoverability, right? What are you able to recover from? And what plays into recoverability? All the things I mentioned before and hormones. Professional bodybuilder, I was pretty advanced when it came to hormones. <laughs> I was definitely a little enhanced and a little advanced when it came to my ability to recover. So I was able to sustain higher amounts of volume, higher amounts of frequency, and I grew faster than most people ever will, not because of the, the substances themselves, because the substances themselves massively increased my ability to recover faster. So when you get these guys who talk about, you know, if, if you have any coaches out there or any bodybuilders, whatever, who maybe uh, deny the value of management of stress or deny the value of sleep or deny the value of breath work and meditation and muscle building, you can rest assured that the reason that it is, is because they're they're enhanced. There's nothing wrong with that, right? I'm not going to judge anybody who's enhanced. When I say enhanced, I'm talking about anabolic enhancements. 
So the way you think about anabolics is it's the ultimate override of your stress. So it's it's the ultimate way to put out the fire, right? When I'm creating a huge amount of stress in the gym or a huge amount of stress in my brain, I'm creating these little like metabolic fires. Like you're creating inflammation and you're causing damage. Then the hormones just come along and go, we're going to put that out. You're good. You can go again tomorrow. And that's why they became such a huge asset and certainly a hugely used substance in many areas of life. Because they're this auto, this ultimate autonomic override. If you are stressed, if you're fatigued, if your muscles are breaking down, boom, it stops. Right? Some people have amazing testosterone levels naturally, amazing hormone levels naturally, lower estrogen, lower DHT, lower cortisol, and really great testosterone. Good for you. But if you don't, well, then you can still optimize it. Right? You should be doing everything you possibly can to optimize testosterone. I do have another course coming out on how to optimize testosterone naturally and then another course that, that kind of tandems with that on how to optimize the use of exogenous testosterone. Not necessarily like dosaging, but how to make the most of what you're already taking. So if your doctor is prescribing it for you, there's definitively some things you can and should be doing that make your the utilization of the product more effective. It brings down your sex hormone binding globulin, uh, improves your ability to utilize the testosterone, create more free testosterone, ultimately maximize growth while on it. So again, it's a long list of things, right? So we talk, if we come back to the, the topic in the beginning of the podcast, topic at hand, it's like, hey, I want to optimize for protein. Well, there's a long list of things that I've just suggested there that how are you going to optimize for protein? And the frequency and intensity and volume of training, it, it matters and it's variable. So if you're someone who's out there who's doing the same workouts week in, week out, or you're just going in and doing what feels good that day, good for you. Don't assume you're going to build muscle. Right? Don't 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 wrongly convince yourself that you're going to build any muscle going in there and just arbitrarily doing what feels okay that day, or doing the same crap week in week out because it stops working. And unless you you know what I say is intelligently designing a workout program or even a single workout, you're probably not optimizing the muscle building signal, especially because if you're doing the typical like I'm going to do two two exercises that are heavy, two exercises for for hypertrophy like mid range, and then one for pump. Well, great, but that's not going to work forever. Right, there needs to be some progression, some variation within your program to elicit a signal. You guys have heard me talk about this a few minutes ago, then repeat it. There's a neurological adaptation at the nervous system, there's a muscular adaptation at the at the muscles, and there's an energetic adaptation at the mitochondria, so mitochondria side is all where energy is produced. Each of those, think of them in terms of a volume knob, each of them needs to be elicited in varying amounts or progressive amounts. You can't simply do the same thing over and over again and expect to get a different result definition of insanity. Not good. Don't do it. So coming back around to the beginning, all of these things have to be there. So when it comes to nutrition specifically for building muscle, it's not just about what you eat, although that matters. That's only one factor. There's all these other things that are going to play into it. What does my body actually do with what I eat? Am I creating the sitting in the gym? Am I allowing my, my body to be in a recovery state so I'm not getting overridden by catabolic breakdown signals and catabolic breakdown hormones? Am I getting enough sleep? Am I getting enough total calories? Uh, am I maybe then, maybe, and then now the icing on the cake, maybe I'm going to add some supplements in and like some some natural health supplements to ensure my body has the ability to recover. My body has the ability to produce energy, right? Maybe then I'm adding in some, you know, this is, again, remember, this is the icing on the cake that if you're not doing the other stuff, if you're not sleeping, if you're not eating the protein, if you're not eating enough high quality calories and nutrients, you know, if you're not training correctly and getting the signal, you're not going to grow no matter how many supplements you take. So supplements are the icing on the cake, right? There may be 5%, maybe. And I'm a big fan of supplements, right? Supplements can be great, but remember that supplements work more effectively the harder you train. The more you are kind of even to a depleted state or into an almost, almost overtrained state, supplements actually work more effectively for some people in those states, right? If you haven't taken a magnesium supplement in three months, when you take one, you're going to feel different. And don't don't not take a magnesium supplement. Never should take magnesium. I, most most people should be taking magnesium because it's so replete in our or depleted in our um, uh, food supply. But as an example, if you're depleted in some energy or in some um, nutrient and you supplement with it, you're going to feel different. So as an example, if you're taking some, if you're deplete or lacking some uh, amino acids and you take an essential amino acid supplement, the difference is enormous. 
because your brain will work differently, your nervous system will work differently, your recovery will be different, right? If you're depleted in, in um, I don't know, any type of vitamin, you're going to feel different. I was depleted in uh, riboflav for the longest time. I had no idea. And uh, I took some riboflavin. And gosh, it was like somebody turned the lights on. Riboflavin. How many people have actually heard of riboflavin? Right? I didn't know. I tested and I felt incredible after that. So these are just icing on the cake. What supplements should we be taking? Well, essential amino acids is probably a good idea just to ensure that you're getting all the base aminos. I also suggest everyone take collagen when it comes to optimizing for muscle building. I really like collagen and about 10 to 20% of my total protein intake for the day. It can also come from bone broth. I just like to, to make sure we have enough uh, the amine, of the amino acid glycine in there. You can take supplemental glycine. You can take magnesium glycinate to get a little extra glycine. But in general, we need a few grams of glycine a day. It's been shown to be really, really useful for recovery, for blood glucose regulation, for joint health, uh, collagen synthesis, things like this. Very, very important. What else is useful for when it comes to supplements specific to ultimately building muscle? Obviously, creatine is the mother of all muscle building supplements. We could take things like, you know, I've been taking lately that I like is colostrum protein. There's a product called Sir Thrival that I have no affiliation with, but I really, probably the highest quality colostrum I've taken. Love it, delicious, and really high quality. Well, everyone should be taking vitamin D and K2. Again, that's it. Maybe a multivitamin, maybe some fish oils, you know, maybe some vitamin B and vitamin C. Like, I think it, a lot of situations, the, the way I explain supplements to people is three tiers, right? You've got tier one, which is kind of the foundation. These are things that everyone should take because they're depleted in your, in your food supply. And there's like seven things that are more or less what I just told you. And there's tier two, which is situational. And that could be, hey, I'm sleeping poorly bad, or hey, my gut health is messed up, or hey, I, my, I know I have some small intestinal bacterial overgrowth because I have really bad gas, or you know, my brain uh, feels foggy, or I, I have a problem producing energy, or you know, situational stuff. That's tier two. Tier three, is now performance supplements. And this is where most people like to go and they're like, oh, I need, I want some more caffeine or I want some more nootropics or I want some more NMN. And all these things are like, no man, you don't need that. Like fill up your bases first. And then we could talk about those, you know, longevity supplements. And those are great, sure. But not if you're missing like core level base micronutrients, it's just a waste of your time. Like if you're not getting enough sodium, magnesium, potassium, the basic electrolytes, taking five grams of resveratrol a day, it's not going to help you, right? You got to manage your oxidative stress. So, so we've covered protein and, and I think protein is the, the most important nutrient when it comes to muscle building. Now, when it comes to designing a muscle building diet, this is maybe part two of this conversation. Um, it's actually quite simple and there's a little bit of individual variance, but people confuse this and they complicate it and you, you can do so much with so little advice. Here it is. As I just said, First, optimize for protein. Because if you want to build muscle, if you want to lose fat, protein is going to be your most important nutrient. Next, determine what your, your basal metabolic rate is and your total daily expenditure. Now, your BMR is what you burn in a coma. That plus what you're expending in a day is going to be your total daily expenditure, right? So, yeah, let's say you're 3,000 calories and let's say you're two, 200 pounds. So, you need 200 grams of protein a day because we just said it's going to be um, about one gram per pound. You go a little over. You feel like your recovery is not great, um, or maybe your digestion, absorption, assimilation is not great. So you got to go up a little bit. You know, if, if someone's two hundred pounds, the most I'll go is two fifty. And then, you know, okay, great. I've got uh, twenty two hundred calories left over. I just need to distribute this between carbs and fat, really whatever amount that feels good to me. With it, with the asterisk that if you're training hard, you need carbohydrates. You need to fuel performance. You don't need more carbohydrates than what you need to fuel. So if I'm training for 45 minutes a day and it's kind of lackadaisical, then I probably don't need huge amounts of carbohydrates, maybe 150 to 200 grams for someone that body weight, right? So let's say 200 grams of carbs, 200 grams of protein. So where does that put me? That puts me at 1,600 calories. So then I need to have 1,400 calories in fat, okay? Figure out the math. I don't know what that works out to be. Actually, it's pretty close to exactly 150 grams. So there's my diet for the day. 200 carbs, 200 fat, I'm sorry, 200 protein, 150 fat. And that's your, your diet. And if that, see how it feels, start there, work through that. So you've just hit your, your total daily, again, I just made these numbers up, but that's that's basically the way you fix it. And if you're like, hey, you know what? I feel like I'm my energy is fluctuating too much the other day. I'm up and I'm down and I'm up and I'm down. Well, great. Drop your carbs down a little bit. Eat more, more fat. Or if you're like, hey, you know what? I'm really lacking a pump and I really don't feel good in the gym. I feel like I could have a little more energy. Good. Pump your carbs up. 
right? Or I feel like I'm not recovering fully from the workout. Okay, good. Pump your, car- bump your carbs up a little bit. I feel like, you know, what you just got to look at what are the symptoms I'm experiencing and what nutrient is, is either causing it or hindering it, right? So if I feel like I, you know, I eat a meal and I feel really lethargic afterwards and I want to sleep or I eat a meal and two hours later I'm hangry and I just like, oh, I got to eat again. You're probably insulin resistant, metabolically inflexible. So we got to fix that. Otherwise, your body will never burn fat, right? And so this is another very, 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 very important topic to consider. And this is a big part of my phase one program as well, teaching you how to improve for metabolic flexibility. And metabolic flexibility is really simply the ability to switch between fuels, meaning best example or an example is if I eat 100 grams of carbs, let's say it's noon and I eat 100 grams of carbs. Three hours later, two hours later, how do I feel? And what should happen is if I eat 100 grams of carbs, which is a lot, I'll get a, I'll go to glucose spike in the blood. My body will respond by producing insulin. Insulin will go up in the blood. And those two things should come down more or less concurrently together. And if they don't, meaning if my blood glucose keeps com- coming down and maybe it stays down or, or maybe it keeps coming down drastically, what usually happens is the blood glucose starts to come down. Picture it coming down the backside of the mountain. Well, then your body has had enough carbohydrate and it'll start releasing fat to be burned, right? So your body typically likes to balance between carbs and fat. It's not good. There's many things that influence how, what, which one it emphasizes, either carbs or fat, but you know, things like hormones and activity level and uh, insulin sensitivity, these things will influence and your resting glucose levels will influence how much fat you burn at rest. So if your blood glucose is coming down, you've got a healthy metabolism, the body starts releasing fat to the bloodstream to be burned, to be oxidized. But if your body isn't good at that, your blood glucose stays a little elevated or drops really low, then the body goes, okay, well, we're going to hang on to this fat and you're going to feel really, really bad right now until I either, one, release um, glu- glucagon, which causes the body to release its own glucose, or you're going to eat again. You're going to feel so low, hypoglycemic, that you're going to immediately need to eat again. And this is people who get hangry, right? If you ever get angry between meals, this is a big problem. You're just metabolically inflexible. And until you fix that, your ability to burn fat will be diminished. Your ability to build muscle will be diminished. And you should make that a top priority. It's a big priority for us in phase one, this program that I've created that launches April 1st. So hopefully that helps. Hopefully it gives you a little perspective on how to optimize nutrition for muscle building and fat loss. Same thing, guys. It's the, it's the more, it's exact same framework. What is the difference? If I want to build muscle, I look at my basal metabolic rate, my total daily expenditure, and maybe I bump it up by 10%, depending where, where my body fat level is. My body fat's high, I don't bump it up by, by quite 10%. My body fat's low, then maybe I bump it up by 20% over my total daily expenditure, right? Because I want to fuel performance. It gradually goes up. It doesn't go up uh, drastically, right? If I want to lose fat, maybe I just stay at my TD, my total daily expenditure, just maybe 5% below it. Because I don't want to drop into too much of a caloric deficit. Because then what happens to my performance? Ah, my performance goes to, to the poop. And if you guys have ever heard me talk about how I choose uh, what what lever to pull when it comes to losing fat, it comes down to this: to managing stress is probably the most important thing we're going to do in modern society. You need to manage your stress, and calories are an enormous lever to manage stress. If you take away somebody's calories, their ability to manage stress falls. Their sleep goes to crap. Their psychology goes to crap. Their training goes to crap. Guess what happens? the results. They too go to crap. Not a good idea. So we keep calories high or as high as we can without obviously adding fat. And we aim to fuel performance or fuel other ways to get the body to burn fat rather than just being in a massive caloric deficit. Because in my experience, a massive caloric deficit works for a very short period of time before it stops working and then the body reverses because you're usually in stress overload or stress overwhelm. So the most intelligent approach is Fuel performance, right? Increase your ability to do high quality work. And when you do, guess what? Build muscles. You, you build a body, right? A body that you enjoy, right? A body that moves well, feels great. Right? Rather than like starving myself, which again, cool if you want to, nothing wrong with it. But in general, most people who lose weight too quickly or starve themselves in general tend to binge when it's done. They in general tend to gain weight back. If you're not someone who's followed, uh, or if you if you're not someone who can follow a diet plan, um, you know, religiously, you're probably going to fall off the the bandwagon. You're probably going to hurt yourself, or, or not hurt yourself, but like fat again, right? So, hopefully that helps. Uh, I tried to keep this podcast as short as I possibly could, but as actionable as I possibly could. 
So just kind of summarizing again, prioritize protein. So I, I really recorded this podcast for my clients because I get some of the people that come into my ecosystem and say, man, what, how should I eat? Well, it's a really oversimplified version. I actually just created a nutrition course that I call Nutrition 101 that I'm going to be recording for everyone that joins my coaching. So as you guys know, we've been growing this coaching community for coming up on two years now. And it's so wonderful. Like I love connecting with, with uh, just high, high achieving men. And I say high achieving, but it's men who have the desire to be their, their best, right? It's, it's men who hold each other accountable and who push each other hard and who just want to be great in everything we do. And it's, it's a no, no BS community. We support each other. We push each other. Um, yeah, your workouts are going to be hard, um, but only relative to what you're able to, to recover from. So the goal isn't to just like smash you into the ground. But like I always say, I'm not a cheerleader. I'm here, to, I'm, I'm here to do things correctly for you. I'm not here to yell at you and, and, and you know, tell you to work hard. Like I will, but it's more about like, let's be scientific about this and let's be progressive about this. Let's build something your body actually is able to recover from and adapt to other than just some arbitrary, you know, hard work that you pull off the internet. Great. That feels good once in a while, right? I'm all for doing one, what I call ball builder workout a week. Go nuts. But the other time should be methodical and intentional to not only make you look better, but make you move better, right? Look, feel, and perform at your best. It's really how we approach the muscle intelligence coaching. And so for someone who's struggling with your ability to add muscle or your ability to lose fat, or maybe you're struggling with your ability to move well. And like one of my big targets now that I'm coming up on my 42nd birthday is I just want to move well. I want to play with my kids. So my, my thing is like strong and agile, right? If my kids take off running on the road and I can't run after them, which by the way, right now I can't I'll tell you that in a second. I hate that. Right now, I still want to be the man who's winning tag and <laughs> like I'm competitive. So yeah, I end up tearing my calf. So my knee doesn't bend, which is very unusual. I can't bend my knee past 90 degrees. So my squatting's kind of gone out the window. Although if you've seen a video of me squatting with Dorian Yates lately, I've made sure that my knee bent, but it literally physically won't bend anymore. Like I can't take it past where it stops, which is sucks. But I'm sure I get that fixed. I actually tore my calf playing with my kids. <laughs> I'll get old. I uh, just keep kidding. It was, it was torn from bodybuilding. It just got a little worse. And now my knees doesn't rotate. But yeah, my goal is like, I want to be strong. I want to look great. And I want to be able to move. I want to be able to play. I want to be mobile. Like, I'm going to be the old man who's like tight and can't move. That's my thing. I want to be young until I'm old or young until I'm not, I guess. So ladies and gents, thanks for being here. Um, I've had so many great adventures over the last few months that I'm going to look forward to sharing with you here on the podcast. I have a travel podcast coming up soon because so many of my guys say, hey man, how do you how do you travel? What do you do when I travel? So if that's interesting to you, uh, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. I have a podcast coming up soon about peptides. I have a podcast coming up soon about longevity and muscle building, the interplay or the uh, relationship between longevity and muscle building. If those things sound interesting to you, uh, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. If this has been useful for you, be sure to share with at least one person you know and love who ultimately wants to understand how to eat. I, I couldn't have made it much more simple. Right? I tried to do my best to make it as simple as possible because ultimately things that are effective are most often very simple. It doesn't have to be complex. Now, there's a couple of things I could have added in there as far as like, you need to eat more vegetables. I think everyone should eat more vegetables. I'm not on the carnivore bandwagon. I think it's useful for a short period of time, but I think vegetables are a big part of, of uh, an, an omnivore, an optimized diet, I would say. Um, I think most of these people on a carnivore diet will come back around and maybe they're genetically predisposed to being used to, to eating a carnivore diet. That's great. But I think most people need some type of vegetables. Today's podcast is brought to you by our friends at Bioptimizers. If you've heard my podcast with Matt Gallant, he's legitimately one of my favorite human beings. I just love people who are willing to go all in, right? Willing to just put their balls on the line and go all in. Matt, every time I meet him, he's doing something that's all in. I just love that. I admire that so much. Whether it's optimizing his brain, optimizing his nervous system, his meditation, his diet, he's always got some amazing experiment on the go. And which is why I'm not surprised that Bioptimizers has become such an incredibly successful company, just revolutionizing, being pioneers in the supplement space, just incredible products. And, and they've done it again with Sleep Breakthrough. And if you guys haven't heard my podcast with him, go listen to it because everything he says is awesome. It's gold. He's so well-researched, so intelligent, so thoughtful in his words. Sleep Breakthrough is their new product and it's got all the most important ingredients that you're going to need in a sleep product, in a, in a powder that tastes absolutely delicious. I actually took it last night and had an amazing sleep. 
By the way, I also added in a uh, new pulse electromagnetic frequency mat under my my mattress, which I'll tell under my sheet, which I'll tell you about next episode as well. PEMF mat, which is improving my HRV significantly, which I obviously measure with my aura ring. Um, again, no affiliations with any of these companies anymore, except for Sleep Breakthrough, Bioptimizers, our friends at Bioptimizers are the sponsor of this podcast. So if you guys haven't tried their amazing suite of products, you're missing out. You're missing out. Go get Sleep Breakthrough right now, sleepbreakthrough.com or bioptimizers.com slash muscle. And use the code muscle10 to get hooked up at checkout with all the products. Get Sleep Breakthrough, get Magnesium Breakthrough, get Masszymes, get the Capex. All the products are just so great. Head over there now, bioptimizers.com slash muscle. Use the code muscle10 to get hooked up with our amazing products. Ladies and gents, thanks for being here and live your greatest life in a body that you absolutely love. Thanks for listening to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. For full episode guides with important takeaways and bonus resources, head over to muscleintelligence.com slash learn. If you enjoy the show and find value in the content, please subscribe Share this podcast with at least one person you know and love who would benefit from this content. Leave us a review and support our sponsors. You can see the full list of show sponsors, discounts, and get exclusive muscle intelligence deals at muscleintelligence.com slash resources. To join our private community and get VIP access to my master classes, upcoming muscle camps, and other resources that we don't post anywhere else, head to muscleintelligence.com slash community. Most of all, Thank you very much for your trust, for your time, and most importantly, for supporting health and fitness in this world. Enjoy your day. I look forward to seeing you here next week. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.